Hello. Uh, so, today I'll uh, talk about the Great Expectations and Black Arrow uh, episodes of Wishbone. Uh, the Great Expectations episode, the third based on a Charles Dickens book, and the, um, the Black Arrow episode, the third based on a Robert Louis Stevenson book. So, uh, I th yeah, and uh, previously we had our third Shakespeare, so those three tied for first place. Um, as far as how many of their uh, books were turned into Wishbone episodes. So these two had one thing in common, um, at least one thing that suggests to me a trend that I don't really entirely like uh, of the series as a whole. And again, it's getting toward the end of uh, the run, so um, it doesn't really matter. This is decades ago, but still, they're both very centered on Wishbone's Wishbone, both in the adaptation portion and the uh, the real life portion. Like instead of focusing on Joe, like the previous two episodes really did, uh, or even uh, David or Sam, uh, the uh, they they're both it's it's Wishbone in the story book story and Wishbone in Wishbone's world, and I think I, I don't I don't like that as much just because the. Uh, the kids learning lessons was one of the best parts of the uh, season one episodes, but I'll just I'll just get into details and you can judge based on what I say and also based on if you go and watch the episodes yourself. Um, the the neatest thing about well the the Great Expectations episode, which is called Groomed for Greatness, um, is uh, pretty good in many ways beyond the not really having much of an arc for any of the kids. Uh, in fact, it's the most Davidish episode uh, of any in season two so far, but still uh, more about Wishbone. The, uh, the premise uh, of, the, of Wishbone's real world is that an artist, a big deal artist, is coming to town to do a sculpture of a one of the dogs of town uh, who, who wins the competition and win, Wishbone wins, so it's going to be a sculpture of Wishbone to put up in Jackson Park uh, as part of honoring the dog presence in the park. Uh, and the artist is uh, a successful, famous artist, uh, Wanda's cousin, and played by Shelley Duvall from The Shining and Popeye and various other things. Uh, she retired from acting, uh, at least according to IMDb, uh, in 2002, and this was 1997, so kind of one of her last things. Uh, and I guess she did a, uh, an interview fairly recently about what she's been doing and how she's been doing. Um, but, uh, it's, it's just, it's, I think she's probably, and I, there's a football player or something in a later episode further down the list, so I don't know much about that person, but I think perhaps Shelley Duvall is the most famous person to ever be associated with Wishbone other than the character of Wishbone. Um, so it's, it's cool to see, and she's, uh, great doing a kind of, uh, uh, scenery-chewing performance, uh, over the top in, uh, a way that is more so than your know, typical children's uh, television over the topness. Um, and I enjoyed it, uh, even though I, I, I know artists and uh, they're not all like that. Some of them are. Um, I like to promote the not like that uh, image of artists, but it, it is what it is. So the, uh, and so the premise, Shelley Duvall's character is going to make a sculpture of Wishbone for the park. Um, and, uh, in the beginning, Sam is is taking pictures. She's like a photographer, and I don't know if she's a photographer for the uh, the Oakdale Chronicle or or why she's taking pictures. But it's pretty much all that she has to do in the episode, which I suppose is more than the episodes right before this, and almost certainly more than uh, the uh, yeah, definitely more than the next episode. Uh, and David, because he knows computers, is brought on to be. Let's see, the name of the person is Renee Lassiter. Renee Lassiter is the artist. David is brought on to be her assistant because he knows computers. And she starts by making a 3D uh, rendering of Wishbone on a computer. And um, so that's kind of neat. And then David gets all kind of caught up in, in her thing and becomes kind of like her. Uh, he starts wearing a beret and a, a, a vest over a, over a long, long sleeve shirt and um, just getting kind of artsy himself, which isn't really a Davidish thing, but again, David, he's both into computers and he's into the show business types of stuff. 
Um, but it also means he's rude to Sam and Joe at one point when they want to check in on the progress and Joe wants to check on Wishbone and uh, David kind of brushes them away. Um, and meanwhile, uh, Wanda is, she's clearly, she's a little jealous of the success of her cousin who, who, you know, I guess, I don't know, Renee Lassiter started in Oakdale and then got to see the world and Wanda feels stuck in Oakdale. She's got a pretty good life though. Um, and she makes a suggestion from, she's got some experience, uh, making sculptures of Wishbone. And so she offers a suggestion and she gets laughed at. So, um... Yeah, so, the, so that there's that element of it, too, for Wanda. Um, Great Expectations, uh, which is my favorite Dickens after uh, A Christmas Carol, um, is about this kid who randomly runs into an escaped convict uh, in a cemetery and helps the guy out, uh, gets him some food. And the guy says, in return for this, you're going to be very wealthy. Um, and, you know, people will say things when they're desperate, and Pip, the kid, played by Wishbone, uh, doesn't really think too much of it, but eventually somebody says that he's got a mysterious benefactor, and he's going to be a wealthy gentleman. And he kind of turns his back on his simpler uh, blacksmith uh, apprenticeship life, and he starts learning to be a gentleman with Miss Havisham, who is a an eccentric uh, recluse, and her daughter or niece or something, Estella, and and Pip kind of thinks that he's being groomed to be suitable as a husband for Estella, and uh, so that's the basic gist of um, Great Expectations, and it goes through his life and the various things that he has to do in order to achieve this, until he finds out that his intended fortune is, I think, I don't remember exactly, but uh, as, as Wishbone portrays it, it's ill-gotten gains, and he says, no, this is not for me. Um, I don't want to get, I don't want to get it that way. Um, and, uh, and meanwhile, Wishbone, this is another similar to McPooch, but, uh, but not quite where Wishbone thinks he's going to be. This time he's get, getting excited because he doesn't have to put on a costume. He doesn't have to do all sorts of weird stuff and people aren't calling him something else, but he still gets to be a celebrity because he gets a giant statue of himself. And so he gets very excited about that. Then he doesn't entirely like the process of having to stay still pose for it, um, and, you know, it, the uh, temperamental artist is uh, uh, rude to Wishbone about this because I guess maybe she's not used to working with animals, um, and also is used to getting her way. And we also see uh, David brings in some supplies at one point and says, here are all the bills, and she dismisses the bills, and later on we find out she leaves town without paying any, any of the bills, and Wanda is scrambling around trying to make that right. Um, but, you know, as mentioned, uh, Renee Lassiter does abandon the, uh, project and it disappoints Wishbone, uh, and it, you know, kind of throws the town into a, a, a tizzy because, again, she leaves a lot of debts, but Wanda, fortunately, has a dog sculpture of her own that she's been working on, and it takes, ends up taking the place, and I, it kind of, you know... I wonder what happened before the action of this episode that they didn't just ask Wanda to do it since they have a resident artist who is also, I guess, owns the Oakdale Chronicle and very active in the community. Why not just have her do it? But then again, as in so many uh, cases like this, then you don't have a story because you don't have the drama of bringing in the Shelley Duvall character. So there's that. But it's a nice, it's a nice ending. Um, and uh, Wishbone kind of sees it, and it's another another instance where they, and maybe dog people really believe this of dogs, but they act as though they know that Wishbone knows that he got the short end of the stick because he sees the sculpture, and it's not a sculpture of him, and he thought that he was, and they, they act like he is disappointed because he knows all of the implications of Rene Lasseter leaving and Wanda's sculpture, and they reassure him, and it's like they, they're treating Wishbone like he's, but again, maybe all dog people treat their dogs like they know more than they actually are capable of knowing. Um, but somebody says, I forget who, somebody says, I, probably it's Wanda, says there's a little bit of every dog, uh, every good dog in the sculpture. So that's nice. Um, the post-show bit explores the filming of uh, when they had to do Miss Havisham Catches Fire, the character Catches Fire at some point in the story. 
and they talked about filming that and doing it with a dog because Pip puts the fire out. So that was interesting to watch. Moving right along, uh, The Black Arrow I have not read. Um, and it's kind of like Ivanhoe. Uh, both the story is similar to Ivanhoe and I just it didn't grab me as being particularly interesting to read, but I will read it. Um, the story of The Black Arrow is basically that um, it's kind of a it's feudalism uh, is, I guess, the main thing, and two, there are two warring houses, literally warring houses, um, like big, big houses, like if Downton Abbey went to war with some other mansion, um, at least that is the impression that I got. And, uh, and Wishbone's character, Richard, Richard Blake, I think it is, Richard Shelton, Franklin Blake is his character in the Moonstone one, which is the next episode. Richard Shelton is um, living with Sir Daniel, and Sir Daniel is kind of wishy-washy about whose side he's on in this uh, in this war. And uh, you know, he's always they, they show this, but he's always putting up a different flag, and uh, and so and but uh, Richard Shelton is loyal to him because he, I guess, when. Richard's father died, and presumably mother as well. Uh, Sir Daniel took him in, and and he became Sir Daniel's ward, and so he's loyal to the guy. But then you notice a lot of people are turning against Sir Daniel, and he's thinking, why? You know, he's been so great to me. Why are these people turning against him? I'm going to be loyal to him. And he very and he gradually meets the people, hears from them, and learns that it's not as cut and dry as he thinks it is. Sir Daniel's not a great guy necessarily. Um, in the Wishbone world, uh, it's another one. It's even more than um, even more than the uh, than the Great Expectations one. It's Wishbone story. Wishbone has to go to the vet, and it's the classic. The animal doesn't want to go to the vet, um, and uh, and Ellen is getting one of their chairs reupholstered, and uh, leaves it to Wanda to help the upholsterer get into the house because they're late for the vet appointment, so they have to leave. The upholsterer's not there yet. Ellen asks Wanda to let the upholsterer into the house and get the chair. And she leaves the chair out in the middle of the floor, which Wanda would think would be, a, you'd think would be an indication to Wanda, but of course it's not. And Wanda assumes that it is Wishbone's chair because Wishbone's always sitting in it, and that is a uh, somewhat disgusting thing to her. And um, so the big red chair that Wishbone's always sitting in gets carted away and happens to drive by uh, Wishbone and Joe and Ellen when they're getting gas uh, because apparently they were in such a hurry but they could still stop to get gas. Um, it doesn't seem like that big a town. They could probably make it all the way to the vet but, you know, again, then there's no story. Wishbone sees it and so he's, he doesn't want to go to the vet but also he finds out that his chair has been taken. And so he leaps out of the car and starts chasing the truck with the chair um, and doesn't ultimately catch it but it somehow ends up at the vet as well, and so after Wishbone's vet appointment, they they find the chair in the pickup truck outside of the vet, and that is how the story resolves itself. Um, but most of the most of that half of the episode is Wishbone chasing the truck around and referring to what seems to be a Chihuahua as a mutant rat, uh, and then of course the Chihuahua shows up at the vet as well, and the dog that's in the truck that's carrying the chair, um, not that great of an episode, uh, but again, they can't all be, I think I've said this also about Animorphs and Space Cases, they can't all be great. Um, let's see if there's anything in particular. The uh, post-show bit was uh, great because it uh, was about all of Wishbone's stunt doubles and how they have a dog that is good for this kind of thing, a dog that's good for this sort of thing. Um, and they all look relatively like Wishbone. They even have a dog to stand in for scenes, that, so scenes can film in one place, and Wishbone the soccer, the main wishbone dog, can film in another place. So that's interesting. And uh, this, what is it? Oh, the Chihuahua. And, okay, so there's all of that. And it's a little bit Joe, uh, because Joe has to go find wishbone to get him to the vet. Um, but Joe doesn't learn any important lessons or anything. I spend some time with DeMont's cousin, who goes on and on about his father was a hunter, and his dog is very special, and then it turns out his dog is the Chihuahua, and um, yeah, I don't have much to say about this one.
Wishbone seems to eat a slug off the sidewalk uh, because he says at one point he just kind of, uh, and maybe this was an improvisation because the dog stopped and ate something off the sidewalk, and so uh, the guy, uh, Larry Brantley, said, ooh, escargot, which suggests that Wishbone ate a slug off the sidewalk. That was, I think, the best part of the episode. Um, let's see. Yeah. I don't have much to say about this one. But I'm going to have probably, hopefully, a lot more to say about uh, Moonbone, based on Wilkie Collins' novel The Moonstone, which is the one I've been looking forward to most since I embarked on this. Because, yeah, embarked. Um, because I haven't read The Moonstone lately, but Wilkie Collins is uh, one of my favorite fiction writers, and I had no idea that Wishbone had done a Moonstone, uh, a Wilkie Collins novel. I kind of wish he'd done The Woman in White. And then the other episode for my next uh, little video is going to be one based on the uh, ancient Chinese legend, ancient-ish, um, Journey to the West, about the Monkey King. And that's when I haven't read the legend itself. I don't know if there's a definitive English translation, but I have read a book called American Born Chinese by Jean Luen Yang, and I remember really liking it, and part of that uh, book is based on uh, Journey to the West. And so it's one of those, it's kind of like any of these other legends, the Greek legends, the uh, Egyptian legend, any of that, that have seeped into culture. And so I've probably uh, seen a couple of things that are based, at least in part, on the story of the Monkey King. Um, so, but it'll be interesting to see what I recognize and what I don't in both of those episodes. Anyway, uh, let's wag another tail.